Welcome to Paley Impact, part of the Paley at Home series presented by City. I'm Charles Whitaker, Dean of the Medill School of Journalism, Media, and Integrated Marketing Communications at Northwestern University. Today, we'll discuss the challenges journalists on the front lines face covering the unprecedented stories shaping our world. I'm joined by Wei Zha Zhang, CBS News White House correspondent, Omar Jimenez, CNN correspondent, and Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, author, professor at Georgetown University, and frequent contributor to the New York Times opinion page. Welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for having us. I have worked with the Paley Center before, and this program is a great example of their commitment to examining the influence of media in our society. So I wanted to begin by talking about the media's responsibility during these times of crisis, with COVID raging, the ongoing protests after the murder of George Floyd. Um, let's, let's start with our two journalists, uh, Omar and Weja. What do you think the media's responsibility here is, here is in terms of coverage? Omar? Well, for starters, I mean, I, I think framing is as important now as it ever has been, because I, I think what we're seeing, no matter what portion of journalism you're working in is you get a set of facts that's coming, but it's not just about regurgitating that out, but about trying to say, all right, well, what does this mean? And how does this play into potentially a wider narrative that we're seeing? Or how does it potentially go against a narrative that we're seeing? Like when we were covering uh, what was happening in Minneapolis with George Floyd, one of the big sort of contentious portions that we were seeing uh, across the country was that in the midst of these protests, there, of course, were, were the peaceful protests and then some that ended in destruction of property. And there was a lot of debate going on about the merits of, well, you shouldn't be destroying property, you shouldn't be doing this or, or that. Peaceful protesting is the way to go. Well, for me, it became a responsibility to say, well, you may see these images of buildings and stuff on fire, but we've spoken to the protesters, we've spoken to the people that are doing this, they don't want to do this. They just feel that they've done it in other ways and this is the only way that they can be heard. And so trying to add that framing and perspective into situations like that, I think is more important than, than it's ever been. Weisha? Yeah, I mean, Omar's absolutely right. It's all about the context, right? It's not just about highlighting what is happening and making sure people are aware, but also um, in my case, when I cover the administration, what the president, what those around him are going to do about it and what is shaping their thinking and their processes when they're making these decisions that are a matter of life and death. So when um, I remember covering the early weeks of the pandemic, of course, at that time, we wanted to know just the very basics of this virus, um, what it was, where it came from, how it spreads and, and most importantly, how to contain it and to protect ourselves. So, um, you know, we were really drilling down on those questions, but at the same time had to understand what the solution is and how the federal government was going to respond to it. Questions that we continue to ask to this day, even though we have now been in this pandemic for several months. So I think um, trying to understand and bring to the public what goes into these decisions is uh, as critical as what the ultimate decision is because people need to understand, especially how President Trump makes those um, you know, choices that impact every American in this country. Dr. Dyson, from your perspective, what do you think the responsibility of the media is? Well, I think that uh, both uh, Brother Jimenez and, and Ms. Jang have, have talked about it uh, in, in exactly the terms it needs to be spoken of. Um, what we're seeing here is a clash of ideals within the media landscape. The commitment to ostensible neutrality, objectivity. What does that even mean? That, that newspaper reporters, print reporters, that media uh, in the electronic space, that televisual media um, have, you know, held at bay whatever particular ideological bias they may nurture privately and that they will report uh, as fundamentally a just a fashion, the facts as they see them. So it's the Jack Webb, just the facts, ma'am, approach. Uh, but the reality is, even when he said that, just the facts, ma'am, you're in the LAPD, Jack, and you're in the LAPD that has a serious history of consternating horror against black and brown and you know Asian bodies. So, the media is, I think at this moment, primed to take a look at itself. 
because during the dual pandemics, on the one hand, we have COVID-19. On the other hand, we have the racial catastrophe, the debacles, the debacle, as the British might say, that is now visited upon us. And the media is caught up short because the media for so much of the Trump era has thumped its own chest, perhaps rightfully so, cried in its own beer. My God, I can't believe he's attacking us. As if, you know, it's all right to do it to black people, brown people, yellow people, red people, and people of color. But hey, don't, don't do it to us because we're like the good guys. And the reality is, is that the media has been complicit in some of the very problems that are now being echoed at the highest echelons of power in this country, right? Now news media is caught up short, like, oh, how many black producers do we have? Oh, how many Asian folk are behind the scenes green lighting projects? Oh, how many brown people actually make a difference in terms of assigning reporters to particular ideas that are critical? And how has the media itself in Philadelphia, in local news, if it bleeds, it leads? What about the ethics of media that need to be interrogated? So I think this is an especially propitious moment for the media to kind of take stock of its own practices, even as it is committed, as Brother Jimenez said, of trying to ask questions about, uh, are you just going to repeat what the police folk tell you? Um, are you just going to repeat what people say, hey, you're burning down your own communities? Let's take a look back. Let's do a kind of genealogical analysis and figure out, hey, who's really stealing here? Who's the thief here? What's been burnt down? If you don't own your own body, if a police person can come into Minneapolis and literally choke you to death with his knee to asphyxiate, asphyxiate you, what do you really own in a building if your body is not yours? So those kinds of perspectives, I think, are necessary for the media to really bring to the fore, not to advocate in any way, but to at least put forward an argument that says there are competing arguments, competing interests, and ideological positions that should be aired as we talk about what the truth is. Well, you raise a good point about the reckoning that's going on within the media right now, um, this notion of objectivity. Wes Lowry, formerly of the Washington Post, now with CBS in 60 Minutes, wrote a piece in the Times on Tuesday saying that newsrooms now are questioning that notion of ob objectivity. And, Omar and Weisha, you both went to fine journalism institutions, Medill and Syracuse respectively. How are you thinking about objectivity and, and how should we be thinking about our role as these sort of detached observers at this moment in time? Omar? Well, and these are conversations that, you know, you have um, amidst your, your coworkers, at least, at least for us, you know, with Sarah Seidner, who's out in the field with me out in Minneapolis about the concept of objectivity, which of course, there is a portion of that that will always be there no matter what, trying to present a situation out into the world that then interested parties can decide on how to deal with it. But when we were in Minneapolis, especially, I think it was impossible to avoid the, the sort of usual, I guess autopilot is kind of the word of, of a detachment from the story where, all right, I have my life, here's the story over here. I will step into the story for a little bit tell everybody what's going on, and then I'll step back out and go back to doing what I need to do. This, this was unavoidable. What happened, George Floyd, his community, his family members looked like me, looked like my community members, like my family. And so it became this conversation of objectivity is a given, but then it comes down to telling a complete picture. And sometimes if you get caught up in just trying to make sure, oh, well, this person says this, this person says that, this person says that, and then just presenting it out, I think you lose some of the complete and full understanding and context that, you know, someone like me would be able to add into the story, just from the fact that I had the conversation with my parents about what to do when you get your driver's license and the talk about how to act around police officers. I had the talks about, well, you know, make it out of the interaction alive. That is your priority. You comply, you do it, we'll deal with the consequences later. And having that perspective, I think, informed some of my reporting a little bit more, again, to tell that complete picture, that I think if I was just trying to step out of myself and be purely objective, I think we would have missed uh, some key portions of the story. It wouldn't have been incorrect, but it just might not have been as complete. Weisha, what are your thoughts? Objectivity, where are we now in that conversation? So I think this has just really forced all of us as journalists 
to think about why we um, you know, talk about the need for diversity in newsrooms to the extent that we do. And it is not for just the sake of having diversity. It is because that means we bring different perspectives based on our personal experiences. And I think we have learned um, and continue to learn that we have to lean into that because that's what allows us um, to, you know, shed light on something that someone who has a different set of experiences cannot do. And so that allows us to ask the right questions, that allows us to have uh, conversations with people who are uh, perhaps more willing to share their experiences because they understand that we have um, a different level of understanding um, because of who we are. And that's not just based on our ethnicity. Uh, I'm a woman, I'm a mother, you know, I, and I am an immigrant. All these things shape who we are and we cannot run from that. We have to use our um, experiences in life, not just in our professional life, to enrich our reporting. And perhaps there was more of a fear of doing that because, um, you know, this word objectivity, for some reason, people believe that, you know, you can't lean into who you are too much if you want to maintain that. And I just don't accept that. And I think, um, again, those conversations are happening because we're, we're realizing more and more the value of diversity and that we're not just trying to fill uh, roles here. We're trying to have a broader conversation and bring everybody to the table, and you can only do that if you have representation. Dr. Dyson, from your perspective, what do you, what do you think uh, the media should be doing and how should we be framing or thinking about this notion of, of objectivity? Yeah, well, well, Sister Jang, Brother Jimenez have really deconstructed the thing here. I mean, there is no objectivity. Stop <laughs> saying it. It ain't real, right? Because objectivities are competing objectivities. Your objectivity versus my objectivity. Well, the, the word has lost meaning. There is no Archimedean point of objectivity from which we can adjudicate competing interests and claims. I'm going to stand back here as a justice and be neutral. The Supreme Court, wait a minute, they're, they're neutral. They're judges, aren't they? Let me see. It's a 5-4 balance. Uh, the conservatives are voting one way and the, the liberals are voting another way. And, and Justice Roberts is now the new Anthony Kennedy. What is objective? Let's get rid of that. Nobody is. But we can be balanced. We can be still fair. Even if you're not objective, even if you're not neutral, ain't nobody neutral. You're right. What is that Howard Zinn say? You can't be neutral on a moving train, right? And when, when, when Mr. Jimenez is literally arrested in the process of doing his job, that is the greatest demystification of the mythological neutrality and the ostensible objectivity that reigns in media. It ain't real. And as, as, as Sister Jang engages, at the highest level of journalistic integrity with a, a, an official of politics who is deeply reinforcing biased values and visions about the nature of identity, especially in this case of Asian brothers and sisters, there is no objectivity there. But what it can be, despite my bias, because we all possess them, despite my perspective, we all have them, let me set aside that for this moment. Let me control for it in an experiment and say, this is what I believe, but let me listen to you. What do you think about this? How can we speak about this in a way that is not disinterested because we all have invested interests, but how can we use our particular perspectives to reflect upon a reality and then challenge people to think more in an, a, a far more open-minded fashion. So if you've had the conversation with your kids, if you're the person who's received it and now you're a journalist and you know that things ain't what they're cracked up to be, and you know that you've got to report on a story about policing and you know you've been the victim before in an unfair, unjust fashion, that plays into what you think. So objectivity would say that there is no bias or interest when we select the stories we select. We know that one of the biggest fights in media is to get somebody to green light stories that tell a more nuanced, complicated, complex story, to give us a broader narrative of what's going on. Hasn't the media failed us? Do you think that it's only the politicians who failed us? If media had been ahead of the curve to say this is far more complex, this is far no, more nuanced, when we're talking about looting, America was born in looting. 
America was born in thievery. Uh, you got some cats in Boston who dressed up like native people. All right, that's impersonating somebody. You're wrong there. You're doing some illegal stuff. You go into there, you steal the tea. Oh my God, you're a thief. And then you dump it into the ocean. Oh my God, the first, the, the, the beginning of the nation is in looting. You stole black people, Africans, extricated them from their rest in African soil and brought them here forcibly against their will. Forcible immigrants, if you will. So, so the nation itself rests upon a complicity in a mendacity, and dare I say amnesia, that refuses to tell the truth about what happened. So objectivity, we can't even get our school books to talk about slavery. Oh my God, it's two, we, we, it's two paragraphs and it's done. And who, who, who liberated the slaves? Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, it was him. So the reality is, is that media has the opportunity to really, if it uses all of the weapons at its disposal to interrogate itself, but also to ask bigger questions that the American public should have, and then be able to, I think, give us a, a far more interesting narrative about what's going on. If, if journalism is the first draft of history, then my God, uh, we got to get it right. Because in the age of social media, sometimes you only get a first draft. You, know, you don't get a chance to revise yourself. Cancel culture is deep. So the thing is, is that I think the media has the responsibility to open up, to present as broad a story as possible, and to tell a truth that may be inconvenient, but ultimately may adhere to the truth as we know it. Let me take us back to some things you alluded to with regard to Omar and Asia. Um, both of you became stories uh, that you were covering. Um, Omar being arrested, Ouija being, uh, I was about to say assaulted by the president, but uh, <laughs> insulted by the president. Um, how, for the two of you, what was it like to be now not covering the story, but to actually be the story yourself? O Omar? Well, I think one of the, the important things I was trying to stay focused on in the at least immediate aftermath was trying to remember, I think as part of a habit of, well, what is the bigger story that we're covering here? And now all of a sudden what happened to me fits into that story. The exact type of story at its base, uh, as awful as it was, was about an interaction between a member of the black community and police being filmed. And all of a sudden here I am, again, doing my job. And in some ways, it goes back to what I was saying before, trying to be the sort of objective, look at what's happening over there, but I'm over here telling my story, but the story's quite literally pulling me in. And when I'm standing there, as you saw the video, I was in theory doing everything that you are told to do in the conversations that you've had with parents, with others, you comply, you make it out of that interaction, you do exactly what they tell you to, it was filmed, it was on live television, we told them it was live, and it still didn't stop me from ending up in cuffs. And the conversations that swirled around after that, I think actually did help me tell a, a more complete story by the time it was said and done, because it was a microcosm, again, of the story that I was covering. And then it also opened up just in the reaction to it, just hearing from my mom, for example, who you know, there's a different type of, there is different train of thoughts that goes through your head when you're going through it versus someone who's watching from the outside. And my mom's thought was, was so poignant and, and made me reflect even further was about a lot of this played out on camera, but then there was a long period of time where the camera went to the ground. I was walked off by police into who knows where, and I was in that limbo space, a limbo space that we have seen can be very dangerous for, for black men in particular. Even a story I covered with Freddie Gray in Baltimore, bottom line, he got into a police van alive. And by the time he got out, he had sustained an injury that, a back injury that led to his death. And that was the first thing that went through my mom's mind, even though I wasn't thinking about that in the moment. So when we eventually got released and went back to work and tried to cover you know, go back, going back to covering the, the main story, there was a different energy, I think, within me that, oh, no, 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 you can't escape from this. Just because you're a reporter, just because you went to Northwestern, just because you came from a family of doctors, just because of the way you speak, dress, or whatever, no, 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 you can't escape from this. This is your reality. The world saw what your reality is, and now it is your responsibility to tell what the reality of George Floyd was outside of those 10 minutes of awful cell phone video that we played in. So again, I think it helped 
uh, inform me for better or for worse to tell a more complete story there. Weijia, what were your thoughts at the infamous press conference where the uh, president tells you to go ask China? <laughs> um, well, first, I just want to chime in on Omar's experience. And what was as powerful as watching all of that unfold was watching him um, and watching him maintain grace and continue to persevere just to do his job. Because when we are in these moments, we are not thinking about anything except um, you know, getting the answers, bringing the story, and and you know, experiencing in real time what's happening around us, so that we can bring that um, as part of our report. And when I watched Omar, I could see that you know, even as he was being wrongly arrested on live television, he was still asking why. He was still trying to, you know, report out what was happening to him personally as it related to what was happening around the country. And that was um, just remarkable to watch. And I think all of us strive for that in these moments that we are um, thrown into. Because in my situation, again, I was just trying to get answers specifically about testing. Uh, this was an event in the Rose Garden. Um, you know, there are things that people at home can't see. I was experiencing what felt like a celebration. There were banners everywhere. And uh, this was my third question of the press conference. And again, it was about testing, um, more about the president's mindset. Again, talking about, um, you know, bringing his, uh, that context to the viewers in his decision-making, which I spoke about earlier. Um, I wanted to know why it mattered if, the U.S. was number one in testing if, you know, um, we were still losing the battle. Why does it matter if, you know, it's a global competition if we're still fighting the fight here? And that's why when he asked me to ask China, you know, I was trying to understand what he meant by that, regardless of who I'm interviewing, if it's the president or not. If the person takes a hard shift um, and pivots in that way, I want to find out why. And that to me felt like a very hard shift because again, my question was not about China. Um, and he had an opportunity to correct me and explain why it was. Um, but instead, you know, he didn't and uh, never really explained why he was asking me to ask China. But I can tell you I was asking him because he's the president of the United States, where I am a journalist. And so, um, again, in that moment, we're not thinking about becoming the story and, and the consequences of, you know, um, pressing somebody, uh, even though it, you know, it can be construed as a certain way. We are thinking about getting the answer. Again, I wanted to know why he made that shift. You both showed incredible composure in those moments, I must say. You both did the industry quite proud. I've known Omar since he was 18 years old, and he's always been an amazing young man, but I've never been more proud of him than I was then. And, and Weisha also, you know, I thought you were incredibly composed and poised in, in that moment. It's hard not to take those moments personally, but I think you both were fine professionals. Dr. Dyson, your reaction to those two events, you're familiar with both of them. Um, what, what can you talk about your impressions as, as you sort of see, uh, saw them play out? Well, we can we can see how we demythologize bias here because the Medill people are ganging up on the rest of us and it's kind of tough out here. <laughs> but look, <laughs> and the non-journalist. Okay, <laughs> so, but seriously, they are remarkable young people. I was, and I don't mean that hopefully uh, in a condescending way, I'm an old black man and I'm just saying I love these young people for what they represented. High intelligence, acumen, unquestioned, uh, fiercely asking the question. And the media, again, in terms of its responsibility, are dealing with, New York Times, let us figure out, are we dealing with racism? Can we call it racism if it's the, the guy who runs the country, supposedly? Can we actually say this is racist, Kung flu? Do we have to ask if that is racist? Do we have to ask? If a journalist doing her duty, asking a question is personally assaulted, and uh, again, there has been some stirring up and ginning up of conscientious objection 
to what is going on with fellow journalists, but a lot of those white journalists is laying back ain't saying nothing. Let me ask my question, since she got dissed, let me, let me take the microphone and move on. As opposed to, can you imagine one day if, if journalist after journalist after journalist asked the same question that Sister Jang asked? Right, like you ain't gonna get away with it. You're not gonna dismiss us. You're, we, we, we are of a, of a, of a, of a core, of a team. We are of, you know, the same stuff. And so I think when I saw both of them and Brother Jimenez being arrested, uh, the irony. They don't even get the paradox. Like, dude, at least have a sense of irony. Hey, they're doing a story about the relationship between black people and the police. Maybe we shouldn't arrest this brother on television. But the disbelief in who he is, all of his pedigree obliterated, the evisceration and of, his, of his professional entrails, so to speak, so that now he's reduced to just another black man when he's literally got a microphone in his hand. Did you assume it was a gun? When he's amplifying before the world the harsh, intense contradictions of what it means to exist as a citizen of color in this nation, and yet he is carted off with dispatch and disregard for his status. And then the subsequent lies that were told, well, we didn't know. And then we said, oh, as soon as we found out, we let him go, you know, stop. And then of course, when we think about, again, the media, the media has been complicit in this so, 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 so often, unfortunately. And here's the irony. The president of the United States of America has gone after the FBI and has gone after media. Now, if he were like 60 years earlier, he'd be spot on. If the president was speaking about the FBI that, that harassed Martin Luther King Jr., that surveyed and, 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 and illegally in some times, but legally in other times, you know, tapped the phones and wires of so many activists, then he would have had a point. If he had talked about the media in regard to its disregard for black and brown and red and yellow people in this country, people of color, uh, 60 years ago, he would have had a point. The tragedy is that even now, when you see white journalists on TV talking about what happened to their Asian brother and sister or their black brother and sister or their brown brother and sister, when they have these panels and they got all these smart guy people, look at the two brilliant journalists you have here. This is a great panel, with the exception of me. This is a great panel. And you've got smart, intelligent, pedigreed young people who've done everything America says it wants it to do in order to succeed. And yet more people like them are not in serious, responsible positions that determine what stories are focused on, how we deal with this, how we have a conversation about what's racist and what's not, how we hold the chief executive officer of the United States of America accountable even as he assaults the very people who are doing the job of reporting. So I think that their, their stories, being part of the story, they're always part of the story. That's the point about demythologizing objectivity and neutrality. Ain't nobody objective and neutral. That means that white brothers and sisters are bringing their narrow perspectives too. Well, do you really think, I mean, before the cameras, how many white journalists thought you must have done something? You, you must have like smart mouth or, sassed or back talk, look at all the racially charged language there and the gender charged language, right? That, that there must have been something else to the story. And now that we have these racially pornographic films, these snuff films of the last minutes of a black person's life, which is the visual, if you will, adjunct to the, to the lynching photograph that, that was passed around for the, the relish and fetish of a white consuming audience. The media has to really look at its own practices, its own behavior, and its own constituency in order to understand, you know what, our bad, we've been messing up too. You know, we, whether it's a newspaper, whether it's a, a television um, outfit, uh, whether it's online or whatever, the fact is the media has been super white has been super objective with its whiteness, not, and has reproduced a kind of white invisibility. Because what it means to be white in America is to be invisible. You ain't got to say you're white. Why do you people always talk about being, you know, Asian or black? Why is the adjective constantly modifying the noun? Why can't we just all be Americans, right? So that whiteness has been neutral. It's been undercover. So it has never been, now it's being outed. The beauty of what we see now, whiteness has got to come out the closet.
Are you, well, yeah, it's a race. When, when, when men hear gender, oh yeah, it's the women, let's do, you got a gender too, bruh. You have a gender too. You have, whether it's toxic or not, you've got to confront that. And because it's been invisible to you, you have reproduced the pathology of patriarchy unconsciously. White brothers and sisters, the same thing when it comes to race. They have never been taught that they possess a race too, and therefore a responsibility in the family of ethnicities and races to be held to account. The media especially so, because it's been so chock full of white folk throughout its history that it's now having a reckoning that uh, the, the journalists on this panel, including you with your extraordinary distinction, uh, Professor Whitaker, means that it's a new day in America. And I hope that it continues beyond this moment. So getting back to the coverage of the moment, are there defining moments or stories that you think, that each, each of you think has really influenced events or that certainly captured the essence of the moment? I and mean, they don't have to be stories that you have done, but just stories that you think kind of um, define what is happening at this moment in time. Omar? Uh, well, I think it's, it's not necessarily one particular story that comes to mind. I think it's been a rash of stories in a row, right? Where we had the George Floyd, which actually he, he was killed a month ago to the day um, right now. And you had what happened there, the, the, the video that spread worldwide and captivated a worldwide audience for all the wrong reasons. You had the protests night in, night out. You have the officers, you know, that were uh, fired pretty quickly and now eventually charged. And we'll see if that eventually uh, or how that plays out in court. And then there were marches. And I think there was there was some sort of mentality or thought that, oh, well, they've been arrested, they've been charged, we march, we're gonna push for more reform. Some people are doing a few things and boom, now, it, now it's fixed. But in the midst of that, you had Richard Brooks happen. You had all these other cases that continued to go on and was a, a true reminder that all of this doesn't happen in a vacuum. The world doesn't stop. The pandemic doesn't stop because you're protesting. People don't stop being killed by police because you're focused on this on this one case. And I think that was probably the most eye-opening or, or storyline, again, that, that sticks out to me, that there are, it, this does have people's attention, I, would, I feel, more than it has in the past. But there is a sense of urgency to trying to get things done. It's not like, oh, well, We'll figure this out at the budget at the end of the year. No, people are continuing to be abused by police, are continuing to die at the hands of police with every second that goes by without something being done, which I think has, you would think, would have to be more of a wake-up call than ever to, to people in leadership positions. I will give credit to the Minneapolis City Council who they, they did something different than what we've seen in the past in that there's an overarching state investigation into the practices of the Minneapolis Police Department over the past decade, which I think in cases in the past, there's, there are tendencies in leadership to say, oh, well, let's, let's wait until the facts of the investigation come out, and then we will move to make uh, a choice. Well, the city council said, well, we're not going to wait that long. We're going to do something now. And they moved pretty quickly to ban chokeholds within the police department, to increase accountability, just to try and say and show that, okay, maybe we have a little bit sense of urgency. Maybe this time it will be different. Whether that happens, whether this case is actually different, that remains to be seen. But I think that's the thing that sticks out to me the most. This isn't happening in a vacuum. It is still happening out in the world in cases that we are seeing. In many cases, we are not seeing, and it's going to continue that way until there is some sort of, again, concrete change. Wisha, what, what do you think? Stories, a story, series of stories, what, what is sort of defining or sticks out for you at this moment? So I remember in grad school, in, in journalism school, you know, we, we heard so much about how real people, quote unquote, real people, as if they're fake people roaming around here, um, are, you know, central to every story. And that's what we have to find. And I think that's fine to say, but you have to commit to that. You have to allow people who are going through um, the pandemic, who are protesting, to have that time and that space um, to, to say what they have to say. And I think that 
you know, in our coverage, one thing that I've been really proud of is giving that time up because time is valuable um, on, on broadcast news, right? <laughs> and, and so we have to not only say we want to hear your stories, but we have to share those stories. And, and I think um, by allowing that to happen, that's where change happens, specifically when there was a shortage of PPE for our healthcare workers who were risking their lives in the beginning weeks and months of the pandemic. They were shooting on their cell phones. Um, they were telling their stories in their own words about the horror of not having enough equipment. And so to be able to find them and to urge them to share with us what they were seeing, I think was so critical in getting the administration to act and to allocate funds and to make sure um, they were going to supply what they needed and what people ultimately needed to be safe in this country. And we're still struggling with that. When it comes to the protests, we have to allow people to, to talk about what they're um, experiencing with police and and the horrors of that as well, as ugly as it is, to give them that platform. Because as journalists, we are not the voice of a generation, right? We are the ones that are trying to find those voices and facilitate the conversation. We are reporters. We are reporting on what those people are saying. So again, it all goes back to making sure that we um, put our money where our mouth is and not just say we have to find the real people. We have to find them and we have to give them the time to talk. Dr. Dyson, a defining image image in the, at this moment that you think sort of captures where we are as a country, uh, um, where we are as people? Yeah, I think to, to bring together what our two distinguished journalists have, have spoken about is the image of protesting in the pandemic, right? You have people in masks a mask that usually would get you killed if you're black in public wearing one that that got some black people hurt right and some black people walked into a store take that mask off right against the advice of the you know every uh, medical authority in in the nation because what prevailed over the concern for the pandemic was the pre-existing condition of race and the pre-existing condition of racial hostility that prevailed so people are so desperate that they are willing to risk their lives because what they realize is one black doctor said, oh, we gonna get a vaccine for COVID before we get one for racism, right? And isn't it interesting that the signal remark of both pandemics often is I can't breathe. COVID-19, the lungs, right, sure. fail us because of a mysterious disease process that is pretty unique, right? And then with black men and women and others, other people of color who have the knees of a nation at their necks or who otherwise are being strangled, asphyxiated and can't breathe the oxygen of freedom. I can't breathe joins them in that sense. And they're so desperate because they realize that this is a matter of literally life and death. That, you know, yes, they must stay six feet away, but often they're being put six feet under. And, you know, George Floyd had coronavirus, had been tested positive for it a month or two before. He survived this virus, but he couldn't survive a pandemic of racial hostility that continues to target the bodies of so many people in this country. And to see that image uh, in this country of those protesters saying, we got the brave going out here because what we know is that long after COVID-19 is done and hopefully we got a vaccine and a second wave and we've got something to be able to help COVID-16-19, so to speak, is still with us. Um, so that's what arrests my attention and, and is, I, I found something that was an irresistible metaphor for yeah. where we are as a nation. Absolutely. So what do you think, what do you all think remains to be done to ensure, journalistically, to ensure that we are telling these stories effectively, that we are relaying um, good information to the public? What, what 
continued introspection needs to be done in the media, what continued structural change needs, change needs to be happening. Um, what, what are your thoughts about where we go from here as an, as an industry and a profession? Well, I think it's, it starts actually with a little bit of what, of what Weijer was saying before about um, diversity doesn't just come down to, to racial diversity, and, and we have seen that. And when it comes to trying to tell a complete story of the United States of America, the good and the bad, you have to have people in leadership positions, storytellers that come from places that represent the United States of America. And that means people from rural towns, people from big cities, black people, brown people, East Asian people, you know, so people that are equipped to not just tell the story accurately, but tell the story in a complete fashion and in a way that moves the country forward, or at the very least, illuminates an issue that needs to be seen. And there's more of a weight and gravity behind some of those messages when it comes from someone who is more equipped to tell some of those stories. If I, and I, I work with some amazing colleagues that come from all over, all different parts of the world, which is one of the things I love about CNN, you get to meet and speak to people that grew up in Hong Kong, London, Africa, you, you go on and on. And there are certain stories that as good a storyteller and as, as accomplished a journalist as I feel, I just would not be able to tell the same way that someone else would be able to. And then at that point, does it become a disservice to the greater, to the greater good if I'm not allowing or we don't have someone that is able to tell a story in that fashion? So I would say that from a storytelling perspective, and of course, in a leadership position, as you talked about before, one of the biggest and toughest hurdles is trying to, to push for what you feel is important and what you feel should be covered. And I used, actually, I was, I was giving a talk um, last week and one of the students asked a, a question similar to this. And they said, how, do, how, do you, how, does that, how does that inform and trickle down to someone like you? Well, if you just take, let's just use the George Floyd story, for example, since that was the most recent big story I was on. In Minneapolis, when all of a sudden an executive or whoever comes down and says, Omar, I need you to summarize what happened today. Summarize what happened on Wednesday. There's a lot of freedom that now comes into, onto my plate of, well, what voices do I feel are the important voices to tell this story? And so I think the default is, oh, well, I'll talk to the police chief, I'll talk to the mayor, I'll talk to whoever. Well, hold on, they are important. I think those voices should be in there, but I do think we need to get many protesters in there. I think we need to show that, hey, all these protesters aren't just burning buildings, they're not just throwing things down. They actually have a message behind why that is happening, why that is being done. And just the, the ability and the comfort of pitching that idea to an executive and not feeling like I have to jump over three hurdles, maybe I just have to jump over one, I think is a place that we're still pushing for and, and will make a difference, I think, in the long run. But we're not quite there yet. Mija, what, what, what re remains to be done? How do we get better? Well, I think we just need to talk to each other more. And that sounds so simple, but it's happening. I see it here um, at the White House with my unit. I see it um, you know, at, at the network and we're having conversations that might've been uncomfortable before. And that's what I mean with talking more because there is a space where people feel like they might not you know, have a voice in because I might be a white person and what do I have to contribute to a conversation about race? Well, as Dr. Dyson was saying, you have everything to contribute because you know, you're know, you also somebody who represents um, a group of people and, and that doesn't mean you're gonna be excluded from a conversation about race. And so we need to hear from you too. And we need to hear about your perhaps misperceptions and misconceptions so we can have that dialogue as we talk about our coverage and it all goes back to our coverage and that's why we have a diverse newsroom so we can all express you know what our experiences are and i think you know to be able to do that comfortably takes time because as much as we want to say oh we, we've already been there you know we've already taken so many steps um there is still a lot of barriers to break down. And if you really want to enrich your reporting and your coverage, you have to first be willing to venture there um, in order to make progress. 
And so for me specifically here um, at the White House, I think it also just involves um, studying and preparing as much as possible um, with those different voices so I can, I can, you know, have that running list of questions that I need to be asking the president and other people who are in these positions of power to get answers for uh, people at home who are still feeling afraid to go outside for a variety of reasons for both of these pandemics. And so I think we just have to open ourselves up more and educate ourselves and not think that we are already there because we're not, we have a lot of work to do. But I, I will say that, you know, it is very encouraging to see progress that's, that's being made, to see that those uncomfortable conversations are happening. Dr. Dyson, you get the, the last word. What, what, where do we go from here? How does media get better at, at telling these stories? Well, what has been brilliantly articulated here, I think, has to be amplified. Uh, the, the broad variety that Brother Jimenez spoke about of every imaginable region, uh, accent, generation. We'll throw some old people in there, too. <laughs> and some young folk <clears throat> and get it together, right? Because before uh, we had racial justice in this country. What, you know, many white people misunderstand white privilege. White privilege, hey, hey, I'm, I'm young and I'm working hard and I ain't got a bunch of money. That's not what white privilege means, right? White privilege means that before there was racial justice, everybody who went to Harvard was white. It didn't mean all white people went to Harvard. It meant everybody who went there was white. It didn't mean that, uh, that all white people would play baseball. It meant the people who were playing baseball would all be white. Right? That's the kind of privilege that we don't even think to interrogate. And to, 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 to Sister Jang, in terms of speaking about whiteness and being comfortable enough to share your story, and it's kind of a ventriloquist effect, right? Because whiteness has been pervasive and dominant for so long. And to ask it to be one of many other voices, to compete for air because of its talent, not because of its race, is a different kind of story. That's why you see the kind of resentment and the pushback. And this is why I say again, if you want to be able to, to have somebody as a journalist be able to be supported, have some producers, have some executives who, who feel the same way, who know that this is a bigger swath of America that we have to appeal to, that we have to take our stories and we have to take our cues and our insight from a broad variety of people. Why weren't we already thinking to talk to black protesters. We talk to white folk with guns going to the Capitol every day. Well, let me tell you here, boy, I got to go out here and uh, you know get these things right and make America great again. All right, I, I, look, look, I, 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 I wanna hear that. I wanna hear exactly what they're thinking because dadgummit, I gotta live in a culture with you and I wanna know why you got a gun, right? But we don't stop to think to ask the people you know, who have been victimized so long, Brother Jimenez talked about it, when you say, you didn't listen to peaceful protests. Colin Kaepernick didn't have a gun. You didn't want to hear him. Martin Luther King Jr. was literally killed. Don't know if you know that, 1968, April 4th, about 6.01 p.m. A peaceful protester. So the media could point out with a sense of irony, but objectivity, <laughs> um, the, the application of nonviolence to most social justice movements has been unheard. And America doesn't move until there, there's violence or till there are burning buildings. Now, that's not a judgment against the people who burned them only. That's mostly a judgment of those who won't hear until that language comes. You know, people talk about love languages. The language of justice in America for minority people seems to be, if they act the fool, if they burn some stuff up, if they cause a catastrophe or a chaos, then we finally hear. But before then, they are relegated to a periphery or ignored into oblivion. So I think that what we need in the media is to take this kind of appointment seriously, to talk about people of color across the region and board and people of different ethnicities, races, trans people, right? What we could learn from dealing with the bodies of those who in their, in their own flesh have tried to reconcile evolution and development of consciousness. So when we put all that stuff on the table, having people in spots and places of authority 
to be able to green light projects, make decisions, assign reporters, look at 1619 of the New York Times. Are, now, now, as great as Nicole Hannah-Jones is, is she really the first person who thought about this in the history of journalism? Like, really? And she is brilliant as they come. She is but the point is, you got to have somebody going, all right, cool. Let's, let's, let's see where you can take the 1619 Project. And look how it has literally changed it. Right now, when I say 1619, you know what I'm talking about. Otherwise, you'd have thought I was rolling dice. 1619, you know, the, the double C. You, know, you didn't know what 1619 was, right? Not you, but the America. Now America knows, oh, 1619. Yeah. And then there can be healthy debates. Well, is that when black people were here before then? So let's talk about this. And then liberal historians, not conservative ones. We know they were going to jump on it. Liberal white historians. Well, that's not true. And you're distorting it because their comfort zones are now being shaken. Their cages are being rattled because they believe, hey, we're the good guys. And we believe, no, we all have to reexamine where we stand. The media is critical. The 1619 Project, uh, what these two fine journalists are doing and what you continue to do as a professor, that's the kind of stuff we need, a constant interrogation. And when people say it's a wake-up call, don't forget, if you're still alive, you got one every day. It ain't just one time. Oh, I had a wake-up call. That's it? One time in 50 years? You've been awakened one? You've been awake for 50 years? No, you have to have it every day. You have to go back to the drawing board. You got to figure out what's going on. What difference did it make at CNN when Brother Jimenez was arrested. What difference did it make, right? And that's a fine organization and I love them. I appear on their air, CBS as well. What difference did it make when they saw one of their fine, intelligent reporters being accosted? No, just, oh my God, isn't he ridiculous? What are you doing about your own news organization so that more people like her will be able to ask questions of more people like him? That will be the litmus test for genuine progress in this nation. Well, that is going to have to be our, our last word. Thank you so much, Dr. Dyson. Thank you to all of you. This is a, a great panel. I feel so out of my element, uh, out of my depth, being amongst you uh, amazing folks. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Michael Eric Dyson, Weijia Zhang, Omar Jimenez for joining me today, and to all of you for watching. Please remember to help the Paley Center continue to bring you important programs like this one. Go to paleycenter.org to donate and become a member. Again, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.